Y'all nod your heads if you can hear me. Sweet. All right. Beautiful. Uh, so my name is Nelson Davis. I'm super excited to uh, be one of the many hosts uh, for this tablet user group. I'm, I'm accustomed to saying the Atlanta tablet user group, but uh, today we're, we're super excited to be partnering with the North Texas tablet user group. Uh, so for those of you on the North Texas side, we want to do a quick little intro of the Atlanta folks, and then we'll kind of do the flip flop for those on the Atlanta side. I do an intro for the North Texas folks. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nelson Davis. Uh, I'm the founding partner uh, of a, a data analytics consulting firm here in Atlanta called Analytic Vision. Um, super excited to um, co-lead the Atlanta Tableau User Group with Karen Hinson. Um, I've been a part of ATUG for man, seven or eight years maybe, been using Tableau for about nine years. Uh, an old Tableau Zen master from way back in the day. Um, but love this community, love this group. Um, and for, for us, you know, the Atlanta Tableau community is, is just that. It's a, it's a big community. So it's a great group of friends. So with that, over to you, Karen. want to give you an opportunity to tell the folks about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Henson. Um, I am a co-leader for the Atlanta Tableau user group along with Nelson. And I was introduced to Tableau about seven years ago when I started working for Chick-fil-A. And I work at the Chick-fil-A headquarters in Atlanta. I'm an analyst in our financial services department. And um, in addition, I'm a mom, got four kids. So I am now a homeschool teacher. <laughs> and um, yeah, all four of them are here with me today. Uh, but it's really nice to virtually meet everybody. This is so exciting. We've never done anything like this before. Um, really looking forward to it. I'll go ahead and pass it off. Um, Tim, Joey, if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, so uh, my name is Joey Ramos. Uh, very sim similar to Nelson. Uh, Tim and I have our own practice. Uh, we've been consultants for a while now, been using the tool for over six years. Tableau's changed uh, the way I do business, has changed my life. I'm very grateful for it. And uh, yeah, we've been leading the North Texas Tableau user group for the last three years and um, glad we're here today. Do you want to uh, go ahead and hop on over to- uh, Yeah, community? go for it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, you know, why are we here today, right? So, um, you know, there are a lot of good tools out in the market. Uh, but in my opinion, there's nothing like the Tableau community. There's nothing like you guys. Um, and if you go out and you Google anything in Tableau, you know, there's something already out there, right? If, if you go out and Google, chances are what you're looking for is out there. So it's the knowledge sharing, it's the collaboration of the community. Uh, a good example of this is if you take a step back, the reason we're doing this joint tug is last month, we had a tug on, virtual tug on March 19th. And Tim came to me and said, hey, you know what, Atlanta had a tug also on March 19th. And so I'm thinking, you know, why are we both having tugs on the same day? Why not just do a joint tug? So we reached out to uh, the Atlanta tug and, and Nelson and Karen were just like, hey, Let's do it. So that's one of the great things about Tableau is the community and the willingness to collaborate. So a big part of our, um, our events we do in person uh, is the ability to network with other folks and in other industries. Um, you know, we have a great stadium seating style uh, venue that we use um, and it's a very relaxed environment. It's a lot tougher to do um, in these virtual events. Uh, but we still encourage networking. Um, at the end of our slides here, you'll see uh, some of our social media pages, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Meetup, these sort of things. Uh, while we're all virtual and working from home, those are great ways to network with others. Uh, you'll never know when you're going to need that contact in the future or, uh, you know, it's, again, going back to the previous point, it's a great way to collaborate. Absolutely. And then, you know, we try to make sure that every user group you attend, whether it be in person or now virtual, that you will learn something new, whether it be a new technique, a new capability. So what we encourage is, you know, take that back to your organizations and spread the word to your colleagues. So that's definitely one of the goals on, on you know, one of the main reasons why we're here today. 
And of course, if you've ever been to a Tableau conference, um, they're a ton of fun, right? So we in North Texas, we, we run a very relaxed group. Um, we like to come hang out, share stories, but most importantly, have fun and relax. Um, hopefully you come and learn something, but if not, hopefully you at least had fun. So uh, those are our four kind of goals um, from a North Texas perspective. We love to share those with the Atlanta group. Um, and finally, we want to kind of reiterate, Joey already mentioned this a little bit. Um, we always kind of push the idea that this is your community. And as leaders, we're just here to administer or administrate that community. Uh, your feedback matters. It determines kind of what content we use and, and create for you in the future. Uh, so we'd love to hear uh, back from you at the end of all this, uh, whether in the Q&A section or the chat section, um, kind of what you would like to see going forward. So, yeah. We're gonna you wanna scroll this? Agenda. Yeah. There we go, bam. You want to walk us through this or I mean, get this a whirl? Who wants to uh, take the agenda real quick? I'll do it. All right. So we've got, uh, based on having done one of these virtual uh, user groups already, um, we kind of felt like, hey, we needed shorter, uh, kind of fast paced input um, and to do a couple more of those things. We've also, for the Atlanta folks, we brought back. Uh, Nathan and Anna to do a Kahoot right in the middle. Uh, so you kind of have a halftime uh, extravaganza. Um, so uh, Katie Wagner is going to lead us off and just uh, dig into uh, some fun stuff around uh, layout containers, uh, which would be super awesome. Uh, I'll follow that with um, digging into some of the COVID data. Um, going to look at uh, a handful of visualizations that are in the wild that we've seen and um, kind of show some very quick stuff about how to make a handful of those. Um, also, like if it's something that you're interested in, we're going to do a, a longer kind of hands-on training um, and some details to come on that here in a little bit. Um, and then we'll have our halftime with Nathan and Anna on the on Kahoot. So if you've not ever used Kahoot, um, go to your app store and go ahead and, and pull that down. Uh, Eric is going to come back at the, after the halftime intermission um, and talk about different ways of, of doing landing pages. And then uh, Joey and Tim are going to wrap us up at the end. Um, I'm excited about each one of those. We're going to try to be pretty brief and pretty concise on each one of these. So shooting for about 20 minutes each with a little bit of a Q and a at the end of each one. Um, and if you, if you feel bold and you want to shout it out, go for it. Um, if that's even an option, otherwise hit the chat window, sorry, not the chat window, uh, the question and answer window, keep chat to one side and, and your questions and your ans and answers on the other side. Um, you guys, if you'll go ahead and introduce Katie, I think we'll get this thing started. So with that, we'll kind of uh, pass it off to our first speaker here. Um, so Katie is a Tableau ambassador, a uh, analytics consultant turned um, uh, people data specialist. Is that fair to say? Sure. Um, on a personal note, Katie is one of the first folks kind of I reached out to in the Tableau community and I was able to, uh, to talk with and work with. So I always appreciate the feedback and support she gives the community. Um, with that, Katie, you want to kind of take over the screen and introduce Will yourself. Do. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. All right, y'all. So I am super appreciative to all of our hosts for asking me to be here today. I like uh, Tim had mentioned, I used to be in consulting and training. And so I used to have a lot of opportunities to teach frequently things inside of Tableau. And now I kind of look for any opportunity I can uh, to give back in that way. And like Tim mentioned, I'm very proud to be a Tableau ambassador. I want to tell everyone I can about the tool and how it's changed uh, the way that I do my work. But I guess I have this underlying secret. I don't know if it's the same for everyone else. The thing about it is technically in the tool, I can get by. From a design perspective though, I've never taken a design class. I don't have a background in that. I still have questions about which colors to pick and how to align things so that they look correct. I have a lot of design questions all the time. One of my hobbies, especially now in a stay at home orders, 
is cross stitching. And I think one of the reasons that I enjoy cross stitching so much is because everything is in a pattern. It's all aligned. There are guidelines to follow to create something that you know is going to look beautiful in the end. And so I've definitely tried to find different ways to implement that. I won't call myself a designer. I kind of hold that title to a higher level, the same way that you might not call um, a home cook a chef, because I think that there's some experience and there is some learning that goes into that. But I think that I'm aspiring to be one. And so I wanted to share what I know about layout containers, how they've helped me from a design perspective, just to get to that next level. So the first thing we need to think about, we're focusing on just the dashboard page. And we definitely wanna ask ourselves the question, why do I need to know this in the first place? Can't I just drag things onto the canvas? Tableau's supposed to be easy, right? And it is. You can see on the bottom half of my dashboard here, these four worksheets have kind of fit themselves perfectly into place. The challenge is when I try to add another sheet. So my goal is to have three worksheets in the space down below. And I want them to all be kind of equally spaced. When I pick up my third worksheet, age, for instance, and I try to drag it into the view with a tiled layout, I can pick the left or the right of the bottom half. I can pick the left or the right of the right hand side, but I can't really make them share the space. So it is possible for me to kind of drop this worksheet next to the account sheet, but they're not even, they're not aligned. And I joked on our first slide, I think I have a little bit of a pixel problem, meaning I really want things to be aligned and in order and uh, symmetrical on the page. So that's just one of the areas where I think that these layout containers can be sort of helpful for us. But what are they? So a layout container is a dashboard object. You're only gonna find it on your dashboard screen. And what it allows us to do, you can think of it as a placeholder or a bucket for stacking components. If we're thinking about a horizontal layout container, we're going to use those when we want to place objects to the left or to the right of each other. And more specifically, we want to use them when what we're trying to control is the width of an object in that container. If I want this bar chart to be exactly 100 pixels, I can place it inside of that horizontal layout container. The same thing with vertical. We're gonna use a vertical layout container when we wanna stack objects on top of and below each other. And just like our horizontal layout container, the vertical is gonna allow us to control the height, how tall the objects are inside of that container. So again, it's a way to align things. It's a way to change the placement of those objects. I have a couple of examples that I wanna walk us through of what we can do with, um, with these layout containers. The first one is how do we make things align themselves correctly? I want division, account, and age to all share that equal horizontal space. So the first thing to look at is in the bottom left-hand corner of your dashboard pane, you're going to have the first two of your objects either the horizontal or the vertical layout container. I'm gonna pick up my horizontal layout container and drag it anywhere on my dashboard for now. I would say don't worry so much about the exact placement of objects, the size of them at this point, because you can always adjust those later. So we've got our horizontal layout container in the view. And the way that we recognize this container different from other objects is by its border. A layout container is always going to have that darker blue border. Whereas if I click on something like an image or a text box or a worksheet, it's going to have a gray 
outline or a gray border around it. Two of the tips that have been really helpful for me with layout containers, the first is make sure you have enough space. So there have been plenty of instances where for whatever reason, based on the spacing I currently had, when I drag in a container, it's too tiny. And when I try to pick up an object and drag it into that container, I can't do it. What you notice right now when I picked up our account worksheet and I tried to put it into the container, it's not highlighting in that dark blue outline. What this would say is, hey, I'm placing it to the left of the container or to the right of the container. I want it inside of the container. So my first suggestion would be make it bigger, make it wider, make it taller, whatever you need to do to make sure you have plenty of space inside of that container. The second really helpful tip has been to add a blank object just as a placeholder. You're almost surely going to get rid of it at the end, but if we add a blank placeholder into the layout container, I've found that it makes it a bit easier to go back and add objects after the fact. So as a best practice, I'll pick up a blank object in the bottom left of my dashboard pane and I'll drag it inside of that layout container and I'm looking for that dark blue border around the container. All right, so we've got our blank within the view. Now I know by looking at that blank object, hmm, it kind of looks like I've replaced the container with the blank. I don't see that blue border anymore. So a helpful tip for interacting with those containers you can double click on the tab of any object on your dashboard to see what container it lives inside of. If I click on my blank object and then double click the gray tab at the top, you can see that now it shows us the gray border of the blank object is inside of the blue border of the layout container. So just a little helpful tip there. If you double click on an object, it'll show you what layout container it lives in. I'm gonna pick up each one of my worksheets, division, account, and age, and stack them left to right across that container. So I can drag them by clicking on their tab up at the top. I'm gonna left click and drag division into my container and I'll put it to the left of the blank. It doesn't really matter. I'll pick up a count and I'll drag it in between division and the blank to the right. And then finally, I'll pick up age. Whoops, gotta make sure I'm clicking on that tab. I'll pick up age and now for this one, I'll just show you instead of dragging it to the right of account, I'll drag it to the right of the blank. So Tableau does a pretty good job at this point of making sure that things are spaced kind of the way they need to be. But like I said, I have a pixel problem. So I could think about the math behind this. I know that my dashboard is 1100 pixels wide. If I divide it by three, I get about 366 for each one of them. I've gotta get rid of the blank to make sure that that happens. Sometimes I have to do that math. But in, I believe, version 10.3 of Tableau, I remember sitting in the audience at Tableau conference when distribute evenly was introduced. Total game changer, even if it seems like the most simple component. So distribute evenly is helpful because if I select the layout container, I'm double clicking an object to choose the entire container, I can choose my drop down arrow in the upper right corner of that blue outline. And when I hit distribute contents evenly, Tableau does the math for me, which for me has been wonderful. It saves a lot of time. But remember our placeholder blank, it's gotta go. And because we've distributed those items evenly, everything will adjust perfectly for us. So that's one of the benefits. I really love being able to use that distribute evenly component. I think one of the first uh, 
items that I tackled with a layout container was putting a title at the top of my page. I want my icon to be over on the left hand side and then I want the title to stretch out across the remainder of the page. For me to do that, I have to stack those items left and right. But more importantly, I need to be able to control the width of the icon image. So if in the dashboard pane, I pick up a horizontal layout container, put it at the top of my dashboard, I can then, remember best practice, add a blank into that container. I can start by adding in my image or my logo from my dashboard objects. I'll left click on that image, drag it to the left inside of my container and make sure that I choose the right picture. And in my scenario, I know that I want to fit and center this particular image. So we're gonna go ahead and check both of those boxes. But what you'll notice is that when I press OK, Tableau says, well, here's all of this space for your image. I don't want that, Tableau. I want it to take up only a specific amount of space. This is where I think it's incredibly valuable that these items are inside of a container. Because if I click on my image and I choose the drop down arrow for that icon, I can select edit with can do the same thing by right clicking on the chart. I can choose edit width, and let's say that I want it to be about 80 pixels. I type in the number, I hit enter, and boom, we've got it all under control. If I wanna add in my text box, or in this case, I chose a worksheet as my title so that it could have this dynamic date on it, I can add another object to the container. I can get rid of my blank, make sure that I remove the title of my worksheet. Sometimes you'll see some extra text up at the top. It's usually gonna be your worksheet title that you're seeing. So I'll right click on my worksheet and hide its title. And now I've got that exact alignment that I was looking for, all because I placed both the image and the worksheet inside of that horizontal container. So it's certainly one element of design that I think is really helpful being able to change that alignment. Another item that I like a lot is being able to add in maybe little design extras. So to separate, to visually separate that header from the rest of the dashboard, maybe I'll put in a thin blue item that'll kind of visually separate the two. For me to be able to put in that thin line, or I'm going to use a colored blank object, I have to be able to control its height. So just like we used a horizontal container last time, this time to stack these dashboard objects top to bottom, I'm going to use vertical. In my dashboard objects, bottom left, if I pick up my vertical container, I'm going to drag it out really anywhere in the dashboard, but I like that this one specifically covers the entire height, all 800 pixels of the dashboard. And now that I've got my vertical container, it's a matter of adding in those top to bottom stacked pieces. But I just wanna remind everyone, you're not adding the worksheet into the vertical layout container you wanna take the entire horizontal image and worksheet and bring them in. So when you're dragging those components to sort of nest these containers inside of each other, make sure that you've got the right thing selected. I'm gonna double click on my worksheet. Now the blue outline surrounds the entire horizontal container. And that's the object that I wanna pick up and place vertically. Same thing for my text box. I'll place it underneath the title. We'll take our first, uh, the, the top half of the bottom, if we want to be technical, we'll take this first container, drag it underneath our text. And here's where we get into a tricky piece. Remember I said best practice, put a blank in there. One of the reasons is because when we get to this point, I'm trying to add my last layout container 
stacked vertically. When I pick up that container and I try to drag it in to the view, I can't really place it where I want. I try to put it at the bottom, but I don't see a horizontal line. It's as if Tableau wants to put it in a completely different spot. If I try to drag it close to the bottom, we see a vertical line. Vertical line wouldn't be stacking this segment underneath division, account, and age. It would be stacking them side by side. That's not the spot that I want to put it either. Luckily, there is a way to get around this. Even though it's not in the correct spot, if I pick up that last component and just put it on top of division, account, and age, we see that very important blue dashed line across the container. What we see when that happens is, yes, it's in the container, it's just not in the right order. I want to basically flip-flop these two sections. So no big deal. I can select my bottom half, my bottom layout container, and just drag it up above the center one, drag it up above team lead, job title, and years of service. If I had had the blank inside of the layout container from the start, like my best practice suggestion, we shouldn't have had to deal with that in the first place. So I note all of this because once we've got those elements stacked vertically, just like we had horizontally, now we can add in new pieces. One of those pieces we mentioned was that little tiny divider line. If I pick up a blank object and I drag it right underneath my header container, Tableau creates a space for us, but from the layout pane of our dashboard objects, we can adjust the background. So instead of using it as a white blank object, I'm gonna change its background to match my blue color. Because it's inside of the vertical container, I get to control its height. So what I would try to do here, normally I like for these divider lines to be somewhere between three to five pixels. I can choose the drop down arrow and I can edit its height. But when I try to type in three, Tableau says, nope, can't do that. That has to do with padding and we could spend an entire new section of this Tableau user group talking about the padding of an object. But as just a quick note, because this blank came into the dashboard with four pixels of padding at the top and four pixels of padding at the bottom, the smallest height that I can pick is nine. The way that we work around that is we just turn the padding off. For that blank object, I set all the padding to zero and now I can set the height to whatever I want. So lots of different design things. We could spend a lot more time talking about them, um, specifically borders, if I wanted to place in borders, or if I wanted to take images, control their width or their height, and use them as divider lines. In this case, I have a picture of a dotted line that I'm using as these sort of dividers in the view. But the last thing that we certainly have to mention about these layout containers, version 2019.2, Tableau gave us collapsible containers, super space saving for our dashboards and really helpful for things like those straggling filters. If I add in my termination reason filter, I don't want it to take up the entire right hand side of the dashboard. I can turn this into a collapsible container. But here's the catch. Containers work for both a tiled and a floating layout. So when I turn this container into floating, I then have the option to select the add show hide button. So not necessarily team tiled or team floating 100%. I think we use what works. But I think in addition to all of the design elements that containers give us, this idea of being able to collapse them to save space is really, really helpful for the overall design of our views. 
So I hope that this gave you a nice introduction to those containers. I still don't feel like an expert in them and it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of repetition and a little bit of patience, but I do think that they can help us to be a bit more precise in the design of our views. Thanks everyone. Awesome, thank you, Katie. Um, so in my past life, I led a COE and teaching uh, containers and, and uh, how to use them, how to layer them was one of the most difficult things. So I found, I found this presentation incredibly useful. Awesome. Um, one of the questions that did pop up, um, could you talk again about the value of kind of adding a blank to your containers and uh, what, how, you, how you use those blanks in there? Yeah, absolutely. So in our situation where, let's see if I can find it. Um, in our situation where we were adding components into the vertical layout container, you might get yourself into a bind. So I might get into the spot where I'm trying to add an object into the container and I just can't do it. Uh, no matter where I place my cursor, it feels like it's in the right spot and it's just not working. So what I've found is what happens in our containers, and I'll kind of show this in the item hierarchy. What happens in our containers is if there's already a blank object inside of that container, because it kind of stays as a placeholder, it makes it a little bit easier for Tableau to recognize that I'm trying to put an object on top of or below or left or right of that blank. So it sort of is like when you're wrapping a present and you put your thumb there to hold it in place, that's kind of how I think about those blanks to make sure that I can find that container again whenever I need it. Awesome. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions for Katie? Um, go ahead and post them in the Q&A, please. Okay, um, no more yet. So what we'll do is, if there are any more, we'll revisit at the end. Yeah, perfect. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. So if anybody has additional ones, I'll type in the answers over there. Thanks again Excellent. to everyone for, for having me. Thank you, All Katie. Right. So our next presenter uh, is uh, Nelson. So Nelson, do you want to go ahead and hop in here and share your screen? Hey, hey. can you guys hear me and see my screen? We got gotcha. you. Yeah, you're good. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, so for those of you uh, who have not met before, just a little bit about me if you ever want to get in contact. Uh, but one of the things I always love to do is uh, just like Karen, uh, I also have four kids. Uh, somehow we all managed to create just a bunch of boys. So I have four boys. Just imagine my poor wife who is um, taking the brunt of the child care duties uh, as these hooligans stay at home. Um, they go from eight, six, almost four, and two years old. So it's a lot of activity at the Davis household. Um, and then a little bit about just Karen and I doing um, some of the ATUG stuff. We had our 10th anniversary earlier this year in January. Um, and we had nearly 300 people join us for that, which was super fun. And I don't think we, we definitely appreciated it at the time, but I don't know how much we um, knew that, you know, that would be kind of our, our one of our last uh, group gatherings for for some period of time. So we look forward to having everybody back uh, together. A couple other things I'll, I'll mention: your phone. We do some QR code type of stuff here. And um, for those who uh, were in ATUG and, and were here for our march, um, we had the idea of hey, let's do a a a book and do a quick book club together. You know, not necessarily something that's related to visualization or data, but just something that will be encouraging to us all uh, in this season um, that's, that's happening right now. And so we, uh, about, I don't know, 30 of us kind of read this book and uh, nearly 20 of us got together and had a, a little virtual book club uh, on a book called Shackleton's Way. And um, you know, from the folks who, who did it, we had a ton of great feedback and we kind of walked in and said, hey, if this is good, maybe we'll do it again. And and so what I, one of the things I wanted to share with everybody here today is um, we are going to do this again. Uh, we're we're going to, we've had a, a post up um, on voting between these four books. Uh, so we we'll probably, uh, we thought about closing it down, but the, the challenge for us was that um, the, uh, the voting was actually really close. And so um, we've got uh, still some responses 
to see who's going to ultimately be our winner. So I would encourage uh, if, if you all are going to be available on May 14th is when we're going to get back together, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, take your phone out, uh, scan that QR code. That'll take you to a Google form. Um, let you kind of vote on which one of those books. If you're not familiar with them, just check them out on Amazon. Um, each one is actually really interesting, but for a different reason. So love to have that happen and we'll, we'll get another um, get another one of these virtual book clubs going. Um, the last thing that I'll mention to you real quick too is, uh, and I've got a QR code for this as well, but um, if you want to follow along or download um, the, the, what we're going to do today and just play with it some more, I updated the data for it earlier today. Uh, so you just go to my Tableau Public, Nelson Davis, um, you'll see the COVID-19 uh, training workbook, um, and you can kind of check that out. Uh, we'll update the data for that every so often, but um, you know, you feel free to, to do that. I love it. We've got four more responses already. Real time, baby. This is awesome. All right. So with that, what I want to do is hop over to Tableau. Um, and so here's the QR code if you want to go get this, um, if you want to go get, sorry, if you want to go to my uh, Tableau Public is right here. Um, the other thing I'll mention to you real quick as well is that we uh, we got the idea of, of exploring this COVID data um, and we did a training for a group of students at Georgia Tech uh, here in Atlanta. So some uh, Master's of Analytics students, um, MBA students, uh, a handful of others. Um, and so that was kind of the initial impetus for, for some of this. Um, and we had such a great response. We had over 60 people who did that. We thought it'd be really cool um, to just open that up to the public. So if you're if you're seeing this today and you're like, man, this, this is super cool, but I want to dig farther into it, um, what I'd tell you is is QR code that little guy. Um, that'll take you to a little event that we made. We're trying to figure out how to how to do this and to put our teams info, but we're not blasting it all over the internet. Um, so we put a little something on our website. So um, QR code that thing. Um, you'll get an email response. It'll have the teams meeting in the email response. Um, if you don't get it, just check your spam folder because it was in my spam folder. Um, but hopefully this works. And if you have any problems, just reach out. Uh, you've got our contacts. So um, there we go. Super excited and uh, about all that. So one of the things that I, I want to be super thoughtful about, um, a couple of things just on the front end. Um, the first thing I want to say, I'll just... That said, um, I have done Epic to Work twice with the foundation on some really critical epidemi epidemi epidemiological data. Uh, the first time I did it was in uh, the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015. Uh, we worked with the World Health Organization and the government of Guinea during the Ebola outbreak uh, to help them do the analysis around the contract tracing work. It was myself and two other guys at Slalom, uh, which is where I was prior to this. And, um, you know, kind of nights and weekends type of stuff and, and trying to build something super fast. And I ended up building um, kind of the, the main kind of KPI seven day tracker around you know, how many people have Ebola and, and how many people were doing our contact tracing, who are we missing and so forth. And um, so just super impactful for the opportunity to do something like that. And uh, shortly thereafter, I actually had the opportunity to, to follow that up with doing another project with the Tableau Foundation around visualized no malaria uh, a project with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, PATH, a couple others, and the focus there was, uh, you know, can we eliminate uh, malaria in Zambia? Um, and so I actually got to go to Zambia in 2016 and a couple other things. So like, it's uh, doing epidemiolo epidemiology is super cool to me. Like I, I have a passion for this and um, it's, it's been interesting. I never anticipated ever doing any of that analysis domestically, uh, but here we are, right? So. Um, one of the things that you have to realize though if you're going to do any type of analysis on this type of data is um, this data is human beings right and so we want to have the right posture and have the right mindset as we go into any analysis that we're doing is if you're looking at bar charts and, and dots on a page and so forth but you realize that, that these are these are human beings these, are, these could be your neighbors uh, it could be your parents it could be your grandparents um, and so forth and so i just want to be really clear that um, you just want to treat the data with a lot of dignity, um, the, the dignity of that these are people who are suffering and, and it's people from all over the world. Uh, and again, it's, it's the people that live down our street. So I uh, just want to mention that from the outset that this is a big part of um, you know, how, how we need to approach the data. Uh, Tableau has done an amazing thing. They have um, gone in and uh, allowed us to uh, access some of this data. You've got uh, Tableau created that, uh, the COVID-19 data hub. And uh, again, if you go get the workbook, all these, uh, all these sources are here for you. 
Um, but I wanted to to call it basically the, the idea of, of this talk and, the, and what we're going to do rapidly together is uh, to kind of show you some of the cool things that other people have done to hopefully create some of the insights um, here around, um, you know, how to illuminate what's going on in, in, the, in, in COVID. Um, and so I wanted to, to show a handful of different pieces here. Um, one of the ones uh, that I think has done a phenomenal job of explaining um, how we flatten the curve was um, Washington Post article that came out pretty early on to kind of Mar March 14th. Uh, it helped me really understand, okay, what are we talking about and why does, why does it matter so much? Uh, fascinating as well that, uh, what, 32, 33 days ago, we had 2,000 cases of COVID. Uh, we're over 600,000 of, of them in the United States at this point. Um, but it was just amazing to be able to walk through this analysis and, and kind of understand what happens um, and, and why it, it matters so much and how uh, social distancing works and so forth. And so I love this because it, it's just really helpful from a data storytelling perspective to understand what's going on when we talk about social distancing and why it matters and, and why growth, uh, unabated growth uh, becomes exponential, right? You can just begin to see what's happening here. You know, the one person infects one person and then so forth and so on and, and things escalate very, very quickly over over time. And um, I won't go through this whole thing. Um, definitely encourage everyone to check it out if you've not already seen this, uh, an absolutely phenomenal um, opportunity to, to um, check this out. Um, Another one that um, I loved a bunch was this National Geographic article. Um, always want to look at the past and learn as much as we possibly can um, around, again, the concept of flattening the curve and, and the way that they talked about the different shapes. Um, oh, you, look at you. Um, and the different shapes that you had in the different uh, geographies of the United States. And it, you know, it was interesting to me that you know, Philadelphia was the huge spike. New York was much more gradual, even though, of course, the populations were very different even back in uh, 1918. Uh, but it's also interesting to see what was the duration of the social distancing measures. Uh, how did the different geographies um, play with each other uh, or, you know, learn from each other, do things differently. Uh, you know, you have some that went back to social distancing when they saw a second spike, some who didn't. Um, it'd just be really interesting. Uh, we know that that second spike is going to come um, and so forth. So one of the things that um, as we dig into the Tableau data here, um, one of the things that we wanted to be able to do is just kind of talk about the concepts of, um, of what do we talk about when we, when we say flatten the curve? What does that really mean? And so what I've got here is I've, I've zeroed in into the United States um, and I'm looking here at um, taking in this data set, we have a, a running number. That's just our, uh, our total cases, or we can do kind of a day by day uh, addition. And uh, it's also worth noting as well um, that we have kind of a, a type. So we have case type here that I just drag over um, for the moment. We're just gonna do, look at the confirmed cases. And what I've done is just taken quickly just the sum of, of, of the, the difference. Uh, and that's basically just kind of giving us the number of new cases that we have. Uh, what I was able to do really rapidly uh, was you know, just using a quick table cap. So I'm holding down kind of a control left click and drag, um, which kind of is a copy paste for me. Uh, I, I come over and what I want to do is just kind of do a moving average. And this is pretty noisy. We do definitely see a trend, but uh, it's, it's better for us if we can kind of say, hey, let's do um, kind of a seven day moving average and see what that looks like, right? Um, and so if I wanted to do a seven day moving average, I would not type seven, actually, I would type six. So look at the previous six values um, and then do the current value. What I get uh, with that is a nice kind of smoother curve here. Um, and what is helpful in this uh, season is to be able to see that yes, indeed, what's happening now is that we, we do see that at some point in the last few days, kind of April 10th, as a general rule, um, the United States is beginning to see a decline. Now, one of the things that I know about the United States is that New York is really dominating uh, what's happening here. And so one of the things that I might be able to do is um, I might want to go and see specifically, hey, what's going on in New York um, and kind of check out, check them out. And one of the things that that allows me to do is kind of say, okay, it's helpful because I'm seeing that uh, New York is also kind of on a downhill slope, both here in the noisy data, uh, but a big jump yesterday. Um, so that's discouraging. Uh, but we are seeing overall uh, a, a, a lower trend. But I also think one of the things that Tableau is phenomenal at is, is, well, hey, if New York's such a big driver, what if we exclude New York? Are we still on a downward uh, trend, right, when it comes to, again, flattening this curve? 
uh, and we do see that we are, but it, it's not quite as significant as as it uh, is otherwise. So, um, you know, this is just a quick way for us to kind of when we talk about flattening the curve. This is, um, you know, we're talking about the the number of new cases that are coming in. A couple of the things that I wanted to highlight, and uh, I know we're we we've as we mentioned uh, on the front end, we've intentionally kind of we're trying to go pretty quick through some of these things um, so that we have a chance to, to hear a lot of folks. Um, another great kind of resource, the USA Facts data um, is out there as well. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to, to bring to everybody's attention, let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, here we, nope, hold on one second, sorry guys. Nope, one more, there we go. All right, so, um, this visualization is not one that I did, uh, but it was a winner of uh, Visit the Day the other day. I want to say um, back uh, maybe late March. Let's see, I've got it pulled up right here. So this is from March 27th. Um, and this was published by Overflow Data. So I want to give them all the credit in the world for, um, for doing that. I didn't, I didn't put this together. But one of the things that I knew was we had um, the COVID cases and deaths uh, down to a county level. Um, but I didn't want to go solve the problem because uh, I was lazy um, of figuring out how many people uh, were in each one of those counties. And then I saw this and I realized that, oh man, they've already solved that problem. Um, and so all I really needed to do was kind of blend into that data. And what it would give me is the ability to do um, a metric that's really informative when you talk about epidemiology. Uh, so the, the metric here is looking at the instance per one per X number of population. In this case, because it's the United States um, and because we don't have just massive uh, infections as a percent of our population, we're looking at uh, per 100,000 uh, population, which basically is to kind of say, if I were to see uh, that metric and you know, we basically have 1,000 cases per 100,000, that's equivalent to basically saying we have 1% of the population of that area um, has uh, tested positive as being infected, right? And so um, one of the things that uh, we've, I think all kind of come to love about the newer versions of Tableau is the animation piece. And so I just want to kind of quickly play a little bit of that and um, show that, you know, as, as things were kind of ramping up, you know, through the beginning of March, there's really not a whole lot going on, but you begin to see a handful of places. Um, and also to kind of call out um, the way that I've set the coloring up here is you kind of have that, that light green up through having uh, 100, um, you know, in 100 incidents per 100,000 pops, so kind of 0.1 of the population. And then you kind of get into um, a, a deep orange uh, and dark red um, as you get into um, uh, 1,500, so basically 1.5% 1, uh, 1 of the population. So it's, a, it's allowing us to have a quick way of seeing some of the hot spots here in Atlanta, uh, we've we've had a big focus on Albany. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have not ever heard of Albany before. Um, but Albany is uh, is in kind of southwest Georgia, um, and they've had some real real challenges, and their uh, their healthcare infrastructure has been overwhelmed. I think they're in a, in a stage now of being able to recover. But uh, when you look at the percent of the population that um, has uh, tested positive, it, it is really staggering. Um, all right, a um, couple other things, and then we'll uh, open up for questions in just a second. Um, so one of the articles that I found that I thought was really informative as I was uh, first digging into this data and, and kind of thinking, hey, this could be interesting. Um, this article was written on March 22nd, and what it showed was, um, you know, hey, the United States as compared to Italy, and some of you may remember, you know, the kind of saying Italy is eight days ahead of where we are. And, and this was kind of taking that assumption. And, and the idea of this was, hey, we don't want to be Italy. We need to do some some things, right? And, and the, kind of the title of the art, our article was, uh, are we, why we're not overreacting to coronavirus in one chart. Um, and so the, the thing that I would show you here is that you could see, you know, the United States kind of started slower, but then ramped up much faster. Um, and then, you know, it was kind of interesting to see what was going on there. And, uh, so I'll show you, I, I took this same data set uh, and basically recreated um, that visualization there. And uh, the one thing I'll say that is uh, the most technically challenging piece of that is that you need to write a level of detail calculation to understand what was the first day. Um, 
that uh, the country surpassed 100 incidents. Uh, and so that, for me, that's just right here, right in this, uh, you know, at the country region, which is basically United States, Italy, whatever, uh, if the country daily total um, is greater than the starting point, and my starting point is 100, then give me the date and take the min of that. So that just kind of writes down for all the rows uh, in the data set what that initial date was. And then all we have to do from there is kind of say, hey, how many days has it been since that initial date? So it's just the date um, minus that day one. And so it's day one and not day zero. We just add one. So this was kind of what things looked like, um, as you saw. And then you just kind of bring it forward a little bit, right? Kind of one by one. Um, you just kind of see how, you know, at least kind of remains in front for a little while. The challenge, though, of course, is that we begin to escalate, right? And escalate and escalate and escalate, right? And this is when we're back at, you know, kind of 150, 200, you know, and look at Italy kind of leveling off. Um, and then these are the last few days. And then this is kind of where things were yesterday, right? Um, so again, kind of a fascinating, uh, not a, uh, a logarithmic chart by any stretch, but uh, a fascinating way of, of looking at this data and, you know, if, if that original visualization could kind of be updated in real time, that's kind of what you'd see there. So um, one more uh, thing and then we'll, we'll kind of open it up. Uh, there's a great video on how to tell for beating. Basically, I'll just kind of randomly walk you through the concept and encourage you all to check it out, which is basically saying, hey, you know, we're in an exponential growth period. Uh, and, and we had been certainly when this was, uh, was cash, we're, we're now kind of slowing. Um, the idea though is that ex exponential growth is really hard to understand. And what we, what we really want to understand is when do we break out of exponential growth? And so these guys came up with um, a way of understanding, hey, when does that happen? And when can you see really easily um, when, um, when some of these things um, are happening, like when some of the countries are, are breaking out of exponential growth? Um, and so we thought that would be an interesting one to, to do as well. Um, and so again, what we're going to do is, uh, and I won't go through all the, the nitty gritty on this, but we basically created, um, uh, again, a seven day average around the new cases. Um, and then we're doing that um, in, uh, in conjunction with looking at the total number of cases over time. And we're putting them both on logarithmic axes. And if you're not familiar with how to do logarithmic axis, it's, it's okay, because you probably don't normally have to. Um, but if you just right click on your axis over here, open that up, you get into the logarithmic piece, you just check that box. Um, and that's what gives you the logarithmic axis. And so uh, the idea is that basically as, as countries are going up um, exponentially, you see them go in basically a straight line. When they begin to break out and when you begin to see kind of a curve, uh, you begin to kind of tilt down. That's when you know you're beginning to slow down. You're not, gr your growth is not exponential at, at any point or uh, any longer exponential. So what I'm going to do is just kind of, uh, play this and um, kind of watch this. Um, let's see if that works. Um, I didn't like that. Oh, I see what's going on. Hold on one second. So this is um, bringing all these dots and we, we've highlighted a handful of them and given them names. And so you can kind of see how everybody's kind of moving up that exponential curve and kind of see, you know, for the most part, a lot of them are kind of curving out. Um, and you can also see that, you know, obviously we've separated ourselves from the pack, unfortunately. Um, but even we, as we saw uh, kind of in the beginning of this, we're beginning to break out of that exponential curve. Um, so I, again, I think there's a lot of good news. The challenge for us now is that um, if we if we focus only on the United States and we look um, just at the states, um, I think it it it's becomes a little bit more interesting as well there too, right? Um, shoot, hold on one second. Let's see if we can just do this in real time. So. Uh, if we were to, to replay some of this stuff, I think you've got uh, a lot of the states that were kind of tracking there, some of them slowing down. Um, and again, this is not the greatest way to see those initial, all the different initial slowdowns and, and we've got all the different names and whatnot, but you've got some that are still, you know, South Dakota has kind of come uh, into the microscope recently, uh, but you're seeing a lot of the states beginning to kind of come off of that exponential curve. So a lot of good news. Um, as far as breaking away from the exponential. So I think I've talked over my time. Uh, the one last few things that I would leave you all with is, um, again, if y'all wanna do more of this and the, the, what we're gonna do is kind of do a, a hands-on type of thing and, and go through some of these same things and talk in more detail on how we built them. 
uh, for about an hour and a half and then kind of open the floor for 30 minutes and ask any questions. Um, we want to be able to talk also about like how this is affecting businesses, how is this affecting supply, supply chains, how is this affecting all sorts of stuff and just kind of have a, a question answer there. So there's that QR. And then uh, again, we'd love to have folks join us for that, that lit leaders. Uh, and again, pencil that into your calendar. We'll send you an invite shortly uh, around this and I will shut up. Sorry. Um, any questions? I'm sure there's none. <laughs> Uh, hey Nelson, so uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, is there a way to RSVP to the COVID dashboard demonstration without using the QR code that you just showed? Yes. The uh, if you go download the um, the workbook, let's see. I, I don't know if I made. Oh yeah, I guess you can. Let's see if I made that better. Again, we we put on our website for the sake of speed. Um, we want to be able to not just blast the internet with the Teams meeting and have everybody bomb into that. So that's the only reason that that's there. Uh, but you'll get an email. If you don't get it, an email immediately, check your spam folder because it was spamming me. So uh, feel free to check that out. Yeah, we'll see if we can get that link into the chat window here for everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, that. Okay, so one question from Keith is, why don't we show average cases per million instead of total cases? Isn't that a better way? Uh, to compare countries since populations are so different. Yeah, it's an interesting question. That's why we go back. Um, a, a great question. You're spot on uh, in a lot of ways. That's why, when, particularly when you get into the epidemiological focus, you do get into kind of an ep, in, a number of incidents per X. Uh, when we were doing the stuff in uh, Zambia, we were looking at it per 1,000 because malaria is very prevalent. Um, but, you know, with it, you just kind of want to think about what's the right um, scale for being able to color. And again, the goal here is to understand where we're seeing a tipping point, where we're seeing um, that things are, are happening and, and being able to, to, to dive into that and using the visual layer um, to help us see that. So hopefully that makes some sense. Sorry, I was okay. muted. All right, so Theodore had a question for the Italy versus US comparison. Wouldn't you mm -hmm. want to compare percent of population with COVID instead of the actual infections? Uh, that's basically the same answer, right? It, it is. So it is a little bit different right at the very beginning. And so there, there's definitely, a, once you're kind of in the middle of it, it, it makes a good bit of sense at that point to be talking about it in comparison to the population. But when you think about the beginning, you're really focused simply on the speed of the spread. Um, you know, you kind of, I go back, maybe the best way to kind of even explain why I would say that is, is back to this, right? In the beginning, uh, let's see if I can hit reload on this. In the beginning of an outbreak, um, you've got, you know, kind of a single point and then that person or, you know, that single point is infecting other people and it's, it's very point to point um, and you have that very exponential spread and it just depends on how many points. You don't necessarily have it all over the place now because we're in the middle but now we're trying to bust the curve it makes a lot more sense to be looking at things in terms of incidents per one uh, per x population uh, but in the very beginning just pure number of incidents is actually very informative um, but it's it's your shifting metrics as you go through it, it it's a great question though um, but yeah cool so last question about the data access so how how are you making them real time are you using apis to fetch the data in, with tableau how are you getting to the data yeah, I'll, uh, I will, let's see if I can pull up my Alteryxine workflow here. Uh, you, Nathan, you of all people know uh, that we have built a little yeah. Alteryx workflow. Um, this was as a part of a, a project that we did for um, another one of our clients. Uh, and so we just kind of borrowed that. Um, what I will say though, is that the data is coming from John, Hop John Hopkins. Um, so uh, if, the only challenge that I, I don't know if, if there's a good way to do the download piece in Tableau Prep. Otherwise, I would tell you to do that. Um, but the CSV that we're downloading is the same one that everybody else is using. Uh, we just didn't want to hit it live because we found that that to be unreliable. So what we do is we, we hit this and publish it to the Tableau server um, for our, our, our client. And we, we kind of just refactor it every so often. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Awesome. Yeah, and so we're actually getting that data through data.world um, from Johns Hopkins. It's, they made that available there. It's, it's pretty great. 
Uh, so Christina Campo asks a question, is there a way to show how to factor in test availability? Uh, she's wondering if there's a way to track the number of tests administered into the evaluation. Yeah, it, it's such a great question. And particularly right now, one of the things that uh, when we did this the first time, we were very cognizant of the fact that you are seeing some leveling off of the number of cases. The problem that you have with it is the fact that you are also seeing a leveling off in the number of tests, right? And so if there's a somewhat known percentage of tests that are going to be positive as, you, as you're administering them, well, if the level, if the number of tests um, levels off and, and the number of cases levels off, there's probably a, a high degree of correlation. What we need to be seeing is that the tests uh, continue to dramatically increase exponentially um, and that the number of uh, positive tests comes back, uh, that begins to, con that, that also decreases, right? So you want, you want uh, if I go like this, right? So that your, your, your testing continues to increase exponentially, but that your number of new active cases uh, begins to, to turn the other direction. That's when we know truly that we really have gotten uh, through kind of the, the height of the curve. Um, but simply because the fact that we're not testing, or our testing is not keeping up, um, we may be seeing that there's some flattening that's false. So something to, for us to all to be thinking about. Awesome, we got one last question. Thinking about predictive analytics with this data, have you done any? Uh, if you haven't, you know, what would you do given some time? Uh, yeah, such a great question. Um, what I would actually say is um, I, I have not and I have intentionally not and I would discourage anybody who's not an epidemiologist to not um, you uh, you are not uh, you didn't go to school for four years you don't have a PhD you didn't necessarily study all this uh, unless you did then by all means go for it um, but what the last thing you want to do is kind of do your own model and be like hey I'm smarter than all these epidemiologists uh, it's just not it's for me personally again I, I treat this data with such um, uh, kind of a posture of honoring the people and, 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 and trying to be really really thoughtful about the proper uses of this. And for me, it, it, this is not a, it's not an opportunity for me to take a statistical model and to try to become an epidemiologist in the season. Uh, I trust those that are in charge who, who are doing that to, to do this. Um, if you feel different, differently, obviously go for it. Um, I would not uh, go after that, but obviously there's a ton of contents uh, and a, a thousand medium blog posts that you go read about other people who've, uh, who've done that. Awesome. Well, that's it for Q&A. Thanks, Nelson. Awesome. Yeah, thank you all. Really appreciate it. And I guess I will intro you and Anna, right? Uh, that's right. For our halftime show. Um, <laughs> that so is correct. If, yeah, so everybody, let's, uh, let's kahoot here. So if you haven't already, uh, Nathan, if you, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, please. Uh, let you guys uh, dive into it, Anna. Uh, for, the, for those of you all who haven't met Anna Ford, um, Anna is like a spark plug. She's, a, she's one of our secret sauce people here in Atlanta, uh, in the Atlanta tug. Uh, she's awesome and phenomenal. So, uh, Anna, super excited to have you and Nathan lead us. This is one of my favorite uh, parts of this whole thing. Yay, it's fun. Awesome. All right, guys, so here's how this works. If you haven't done this before, open up your iPhone or Android device, or you can even do this in a web browser. Go to kahoot.it and uh, use this pin here. And let's pick names that are appropriate. Um, <laughs> you know. And also, the teacher in me has can, to remind you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, something that uh, is identifiable because there will be a prize for the top three winners. We've got Tableau swag that we would love to give you. Uh, if you're in North America, we will give it to you via the mail. If you are outside of North America, like our last winner was in New Zealand, uh, then, you know, we'll see you at Tableau Conference, hopefully. All right. Um, and I had a question. Everyone should participate. Katie, you can too, because I wrote the question, so I can't participate. And Nathan wrote the question, so he can't yep. participate. The rest of you can. It was, it was a collaborative effort. And this is... Um, You'll, I hope you'll appreciate the questions um, because they integrate some of, of Texas and, and Georgia and Tableau. It's all the things.
There we go. I was missing the video panel. I needed to be able to see my co-host here. All right, guys, give it another couple minutes here. If you need to run up, grab a cup of water, come right back. We will begin in uh, two minutes. Are you hearing the music? Mm -mm, no music. No music. Oh, bummer. All right, well, maybe I'll find some, uh, some good game show music. Trim dog, hey yo, come on. Represent that A B strong, Trim dog. <laughs> All right, when we get to 100, we're going to go. Come on, that means that only about half of you guys are down. playing. Oh, we're so close. Here we go. All right, guys, so let me just explain the way this works if you haven't played before. We're going to show the question on the screen. There will be four options. They are color coded. Uh, there's also a little icon. So it's dual encoded answering uh, system here. Your phone will not actually say the answers on it, but the answers that you're picking from will be color coded and you just select the color of the answer that you wanna pick. You have 10 seconds to answer the question. So here we go. Are you ready, Anna? And the faster, the faster you answer, I don't know if you said this, sorry, I was Oh, waiting. no, I didn't. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And after every question, we will find out who was right the fastest. And the most correct at the end is our winner. That's right. All right, here we go. Let's get some, uh, some other tunes going. Peace. Question number one, when is the Tableau Conference this year? Hmm. <laughs> Select your response. It is October 5th through 8th or never. I'm not leaving the house, you know. Who selected that, nine of you? Nice. All right, October 5th through 8th. Hopefully to see you guys in Vegas. Trisha, pulling out strong. All right, question number two. Who was the day to night out headliner at TC16 in Austin? Was it Foster the People, Young the Giant, Walk the Moon, or Snoop Dogg? It was Walk the Moon. Shut up and dance with me, Anna. Shut the only up. song they they have right <laughs> exactly i don't know who uh so that was the year that domo punked the whole conference and put on like a separate little event thing it was super fun uh, i don't know if anybody went to the snoop dogg show um i went to the flow rider when it was awesome let's see who our I winner was is there that year i missed out oh. trisha man strong all right, question number three. Which of these UGA football players grew up in Dallas, Texas? Hmm. It's a great question, Anna. Yeah, this one is probably more in the favor of someone from Dallas. Probably. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. Herschel played for Dallas, but from Georgia. Good try, y'all. Good job. Oh, Trish. Nikki J.H. taking the lead. All right, question number four. 
The ZZ Top song LaGrange was named after a town in which state? ZZ Top, LaGrange. Oh, we should have brought that song to Access. play right now. What's that? Oh, yep, yeah. It's actually Texas. Those of us in Georgia think let's look great in Georgia, but the song says in Texas. It's Texas. Wow. Good one. I'm but the next I think it's the next few are, are I think my favorites. Let's see how we do. All right. Here we go. Which of the following is not a table calc in Tableau? Rank unique. Window average, look up, look down, look all around. Lockdown. Ooh, some of you guys know your table calcs. Okay. Let's see if Nikki, oh, FM tab, taking the lead. All right. Question number six, Burt Reynolds, Jerry Reed, drove from Atlanta to Texas and back in less than 28 hours for a beer run in which movie? <laughs> Probably one of my all-time favorites. Smokey and the Bandit. Ooh. What kind of distribution would you say that one is, Anna? Definitely. It's, it's got a skew there, for sure. But we don't actually talk about it as shape if it's categorical. That's a, that's a bar chart. Antoine. Pull my head. All right, so we've only got a couple more questions left. Are you guys ready? Get those fingers Some ready. Some people have to watch Smokey and the Bandit during this lockdown. Yeah. Which company is not headquartered in Georgia? Is it or Texas? Or it says Texas. or Texas, yeah, or Texas. Georgia or Texas, not. This is a good Boolean question. REI, yes. Headquartered not in Georgia or Texas. In, in Washington, right near Tableau. All right, last question. You guys ready? Let's see who our winner is right now. Antoine holding strong. Trish in number two. Can I call you Trish? Sorry. All right, last question. Here we go. Which of the following authors of Big Book of Dashboards is not a Tableau Zen master? Andy Cotgrave, you guys know your Tableau Miserati. And the winner is? Oh. All right, Caesar, Kyle, and the winner. Good job, Kyle. Who's it gonna be? Antoine. Nice. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. Congrats, that was fun. Guys. That was awesome. Great Good job. Disruption. Okay. I think we are ready to introduce our next speaker. Eric, if you want to go ahead and pull up um, your screen, I'll um, introduce Eric. So I haven't had a chance to actually meet Eric face to face. Hopefully I will this year at Tableau Conference if it happens. Um, but Eric comes to us from the Washington DC area and he's a data viz developer at Booz Allen Hamilton. And he is also a Tableau featured author, a member of the DC Tug. Um, he's a trainer with the Millennials and data program. He's earned a visit of the day and his um, resume is in Tableau's interactive resume gallery. So I'm really looking forward to um, your presentation, Eric. And Eric's going to talk to us today about landing pages. Yes, thanks, Karen. <clears throat> um, so the title of my, my presentation is Lay of the Landing Page. Um, you might be wondering what is a landing page and how does it apply to Tableau? Well, you're in luck. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but before we get into all that, I just want to thank everyone for inviting me to speak today. Um, Tableau landing pages are something that have kind of become my thing and something that I'm uh, pretty passionate about. So always excited to talk about them and, and speak to different user groups and, and meet all of you. Uh, so before we get into everything, here's a little bit more information about me. 
So I am a data viz developer and analyst at Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm based out of our headquarters in the Washington DC area. Uh, I just celebrated my year anniversary there, so that's exciting. Um, on the side, I actually am a college soccer referee, so I've been doing that since I was 14 and have worked my way up to the collegiate level, which is pretty exciting. Um, other than that, I am a Pittsburgh sports fan, so go Steelers, go Penguins. Um, I went to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, so big Pittsburgh guy. Uh, on the side here, I have some of my, my dashboards that I've done recently, so there's my visit of the day, the time we have, and um, also included in today's presentation on landing pages, um, you'll see an example of the NCAA one that I did recently. So that's a little snippet on the top there, but um, that's a little bit about me. You can follow me on Twitter at ReadySetData. Uh, you can also connect with me on, on LinkedIn or just send me a message on Twitter. I'm super excited to, to talk with all of you, answer any questions that you have, um, or just talk more about the Tableau community. <clears throat> So here are our objectives for today. Uh, we're going to talk about how this idea came about, how did it get started. We'll go over some definitions of a landing page, when we should use one, some important components to consider when building a landing page, and then we'll go through some examples and where I draw a lot of my inspiration from. Make this full screen for everybody. <clears throat> so like many of you, this is what a lot of my dashboards look like at work. Uh, this is all uh, Superstore data, but uh, you know it ends up being a lot of cross tabs, uh, not that, nothing too flashy or fun looking, uh, because that's what a lot of people like. They like to build everything in Tableau and unfortunately export it out to Excel and do their own thing with it, um, or at least that's my experience. But we had this dashboard at work that was pretty important to a lot of people. It was, there's about, seven to, I think seven to 10 workbooks, or I'm sorry, dashboards in that workbook, uh, and just millions of rows of data, tons of data in there. And it's not always important to everybody. Some person might be looking for a specific ID or, or customer or something like that. Um, but you know, we, we had this, this whole workbook that had all of this data and we were just throwing our users into it, uh, pretty much saying here, filter it down to, you know, use these filters on the side and go from there. But we really weren't giving them any information, um, not, you know, helping them in any kind of way or prompting them how to use it. So that's kind of how this idea started. Uh, we wanted to create something that welcomed our users to our set of dashboard, something that had some important links maybe to email us or reach out to our help desk or maybe a link out to a, a data dictionary, uh, something that provided context on the data they're about to consume and something that had a cool look and feel to it. Um, so all of that led to our first landing page. So here we have Super Caesar Store. Uh, these are our custom order reports. And I just want you to keep this image in your mind. We're, we're gonna dissect this and go into a little bit more detail. Uh, but one of the first questions I got when I shared this out was, what did you make this in? Well, this is 99% Tableau. Uh, it's, it has a combination of floating and tiled containers in it. Uh, shout out to Katie there. Um, but there. Most of this is all in Tableau. There's a few things from PowerPoint, but uh, this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying a landing page. So. I'm gonna go through some definitions. I'll share with, my, with you my definition of a landing page. And then we'll go into a little bit more of the, the details of this workbook. So the, the simplest definition is the first page you land on after clicking a link. Pretty straightforward, I like that definition. Uh, but the one that I really like is the marketing definition. Uh, and that definition is a web page that is designed to take web traffic and convert visitors in a particular way for a particular reason. I really like this one because when I think about my audience and my users, uh, it might consist of people that aren't super familiar with Tableau, uh, and I don't want to just throw a bunch of data at them and scare them away, where they email me and say, hey, can you just send me the data so I can do my own thing? Uh, so I think it's really important to kind of have that, that really nice user interface to our dashboard sometimes. Uh, so it's more familiar with our end users, and they know what to click. They know how to filter. They know that if they see this icon, it will do this thing for them. So I, I really like that definition. Um, and then there's the not a homepage definition, and, and this one's more for fun. Uh, I found in my research that in the marketing community, there's some debate over a landing page versus a homepage. 
personally. I don't really care. You can call it a landing page or a home page. You can call it whatever you like. Um, if you want to call it something different, that's awesome too. But I, I like to go with the landing page definition. Uh, so after I saw these different definitions, I, I learned more about how these things should work. Uh, I created my own Tableau specific definition. So my definition of a landing page is the first dashboard in a workbook that a user will see that captures their attention and provides them context on the data they are about to consume. So the most important thing for me on this definition is it's always going to be the first dashboard in a workbook. So many people, you know, if you're thinking of a landing page, maybe you're thinking of a, a custom portal that you've created uh, to place over your Tableau server or, or something like that, uh, which is totally awesome. Um, it's something that we do as well, and it, it, it's really cool. But uh, what I'm talking about here is always going to be a workbook within a dash. It's always going to be a dashboard within a workbook, and it will always be the first one. Uh, and then sort of like the marketing definition, something that captures our attention, gives them information on the data they're about to consume, and kind of welcomes them to our dashboard. So that's my definition. Um, and like I said, it's really important to remember that it's always going to be that first dashboard. When should we use one? Uh, I like to use landing pages when I have about you know, maybe three or more, uh, or maybe five or more dashboards. And that could be all around the same data. So something that's related, uh, maybe it's the data, the topic, the department, uh, or maybe it's a location or a region. Uh, so I like to use them when I have something that's related. But sometimes we don't always need landing pages as well. There might be times when we have those CEO, C-suite level type of dashboards that are more summary level, uh, you know, with the cool donut charts and the, the big bands on the top, right? Um, and sometimes we really need a landing page for that, but there still are other ways that we can provide context to what our user is looking at. Uh, and I like to use the show hide containers for that. So I think that's a feature that came out in 2018.3. Um, I've seen a lot of really interesting things on Tableau Public using show hide containers. I do have an example today that I'll go through, but uh, using that feature, I think, is a really nice way to add context to those dashboards that might not have all those dashboards, so we don't need to technically have a, a landing page for them. Some components of a landing page. These are, um, you know, you don't need to use everything here, uh, but these are some of the, the more important things that I like to include. So everything that's underlined is somewhere circled on the right side. So uh, first, I'll talk about the main headline and the supporting headline or description. So right away, I know that when I open up this workbook, um, I come to this landing page and I'm looking at our customer order reports. It's the first title I see, it's the biggest thing there. And, and so I know that that's what this dashboard is about. Then underneath that, I have my supporting headline or description. So maybe somewhere in there, I have how often this data is refreshed, or maybe I have some really important data definitions. Maybe not all of them, but some of the big ones that are important. Uh, maybe I have some information in there about who the dashboard owner is, uh, or where who the data source owner is, or something along those lines, but just adding a little bit more context to it so my user knows what they're going to be looking at. Then I really like uh, to include my company branding and our organization logo into my dashboards. I think it's something really important. Uh, if you're doing all this work on a dashboard, you know, you want it to be yours. You want it to look like your company's colors. You want it to have that look and feel uh, or your clients, right? Uh, so make it yours. So most of your organizations all have some type of approved marketing branding guide. And in that branding guide, it'll have things like your approved colors. It will have your approved fonts, all the approved logos. So use that in your dashboards. So um, I've pulled in our, I've created a custom color palette using our approved logo, or our approved color palette. Uh, for Booz Allen, so that's in all of our dashboards and we try to stick to those colors. Uh, that way it looks and feels like our dashboard. Uh, one thing to uh, keep in mind is when you're going with uh, types of fonts, uh, you might want to make sure that it's compatible on both uh, Windows and Mac. Uh, we ran into that issue where I thought a certain font type was compatible on Macs and it wasn't and when it showed up it looked terrible. Uh, so maybe sticking to those um, Tableau fonts is, is the best way to go. Uh, and then finally, I have uh, on this one contact information. So in the top right, we kind of have the a links that look like a website uh, where you can click. So maybe it'll take you to the team webpage, a link to email your team or the help desk, uh, and then a link out to the documentation. So 
really, really nice feature. Um, and you can see that when we look at this, it kind of looks like a website. It has that look and feel to it. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, I think when we kind of design with our user in mind and keeping in those best practices and the modern UI feel, um, you know, it makes our users more comfortable with everything and they're not scared of the data that they're kind of just thrown, being thrown at. Then on this one here, um, some of the things that I like to include uh, are high level filters and supporting images. So first with the high level filters, we can see that on this one, I have the quick search circled. Uh, what I'm looking at here is basically a way for my user to filter down the data before they get to all of it. Uh, so I mentioned that this workbook had millions of rows of data in it. And rather than having that load for all of our users and maybe showing them things that they really didn't care about, uh, we allow them to search for a user or an ID right off of this quick search. So this is our landing page, right? And I will demonstrate how this works later, but you could type in a name, that table will update with what you searched for, and then using uh, actions, dashboard actions, you can click on it, it will take you to the next uh, dashboard in the workbook and it will be filtered to what you searched for. So really nice feature to have uh, to kind of limit down the amount of data that you're showing to your users. And then finally, I said we wanted to have a cool look and feel to it. So I added these super awesome data-like area chart hills. I don't know what you want to call them, but all I did was make those in PowerPoint and bring them in as images. Uh, so just, you know, how we can add a little bit of flair to our dashboards to make them a little bit more familiar. And then in blue, I have uh, underlined high level key metrics and intuitive navigation buttons. So the high level key metrics uh, were um, suggested to me by Joshua Smith, uh, who was an IronBiz contestant and co-winner at this past Tableau, uh, Tableau conference. And he suggests that maybe uh, on the landing page, rather than having users have to click through the workbook to look at everything, you could have um, indicators on the, the front page, on the landing page here that says, okay, report one is good, report two is good, but report three, you might want to look at that one because it increased by this much percent or it decreased by this much percent. Uh, so I thought that was a really good idea. I do have an example of that one, um, but I wanted to thank Josh for suggesting that one. And then finally, intuitive navigation buttons. So um, in one of the examples I'll bring up, we'll see um, you know, how I use the navigation buttons that Tableau uh, came out with. A uh, really nice feature to kind of you know, jump to the report that you're looking for rather than having to search through the whole dashboard for it. So now we're going to get into some examples and inspiration. So believe it or not, I get a lot of my inspiration from Pinterest. I like to think that my head is filled with great ideas, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, so I do get a Pinterest um, because as you can see, I searched landing page and I got a lot of really great ideas right away. Uh, so if you're looking for inspiration or you're having trouble, or you have that biz block and you're not sure where to go, go to Google, go to Pinterest uh, specifically if you like. Um, and search modern UI, search landing page, search home page, things like that. Uh, and you should be able to get uh, a lot of good ideas. So even when I'm building just, you know, dashboards for fun or anything like that, this is kind of where I go to, to get my inspiration from. Now we're going to get into some examples. So the first one that I have here is the Superstore one, the original one that we created. Um, and like I said, many people uh, thought that this was created in something else, uh, but no, this is 95% Tableau, except for these images here. Um, how I added the shadows, these are just uh, floating containers. So I have a light uh, rectangle floating over a dark rectangle. So that's how I added the shapes, but um, pretty much how I was explaining um, the quick search on uh, in the one example is I could come in here, I could search for my name, or maybe I search for an order ID. I can look for the Eric that I'm looking for. So I'm going to select Eric Hoffman. And if I built out the rest of the dashboard to this, how this would work is I could click on it and it would filter down to the order ID that I've selected here. Uh, so really nice feature if you have tons of data and you want to give your users the option uh, to, to filter down and, and make their data set a little bit smaller. And then just to talk about it again, um, we have some of our important links here. We have our supporting description um, and we, we use some of our company logos and branding. So shout out to Caesar uh, for letting me use his name uh, for Caesar Superstore. The next example I have 
um, is the show hide container option. So this one isn't technically a landing page, uh, but this is that option of where, or the situation where we have that CEO high level dashboard. Uh, this was created by Timothy Manning of the Data School. So I want to thank Timothy for letting me use this. Uh, but what we have here is you can see we have our donut with our, our sales and we break it out here um, into our different categories and we have some more information here, but really high level stuff. Uh, but what he's done is he's added this info button. So if we click on it, we'll see that a container pops up that gives us more context about our data, right? So we know that if we use these filters to the right, that it'll filter the rest of our dashboard. If you didn't know this, you can lasso around these customers to filter the dashboard as well. And then these numbers will update as we select things. So uh, I wanted to put this one in here because like I said, we don't always need a landing page for our workbooks, uh, but using this show hide container, it's a really nice option to provide that extra context to our data uh, and let our users know, um, you know what they can do on our dashboard, maybe what certain things mean uh, or how they function. So. I um, want to thank Timothy for creating this one. Next, I have our uh, Betsendal Health Center Chronic Disease Reports and Dashboards. So this is uh, named for Lindsay Betsendal. She runs Project Health Viz in the Tableau community. Um, but, you know, I, I really like this one. Uh, my background is in healthcare, actually. So this one was fun to make. But again, uh, just to point out some of the components I mentioned before. We have our uh, our main headline and our description here. We have our company logo. We have some of those important links at the top that will take us out to uh, you know our hospital home or another link to email us. We have a nice supporting image here of our friendly doctor talking to his patient about his chart. Uh, and then we have our intuitive navigation buttons. So this one doesn't have any any filters or anything on it, but you know, say I, I manage our diabetes department and I really only care about um, that chronic disease and, and everything that's going on there, I can, cl I can click this button and it'll take me right to that report. Uh, so rather than me clicking around through these other ones that maybe I, I necessarily don't uh, care about as much, uh, I can jump right to the report that I'm looking for uh, and, and get to that a lot quicker. So, um, you know, just some like little things that we can do to, to make our users feel more comfortable. Again, um, this is mostly all created in Tableau, except for these buttons. These were created in PowerPoint, which I should uh, be able to show uh, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, just another example here. Next, I have our social media dashboards. So again, uh, using these high level uh, intuitive buttons uh, to kind of click through, say I'm only interested in our Instagram data, I can go there. Uh, I have our supporting image, some of our icons that link out to uh, important links. Again, our, our main header and uh, description. And then over here, I just have some other menu items. So uh, if you have a nice organized Tableau server environment, maybe uh, you want to navigate to some of these other project folders that have more dashboard in them, and you could do so through these links. So again, just kind of creating that user interface uh, within our Tableau dashboards to, to make them feel a little bit more welcoming and, and provide more information on our data. And finally, uh, I have our DC Tug Finance Incorporated financial dashboards. Uh, I'm a member of the DC Tug, so I like to, to represent them as much as I can. Um, but this one incorporates the uh, high-level key metrics that Joshua Smith uh, suggested. So we can see that at the bottom, uh, I have some information here about our different reports within this dashboard. I can see that reports two through four are pretty okay, <clears throat> but then my report one, had a huge decrease in something that I'm measuring here. So maybe I should go look at that one. Um, so this one I think is a really nice report. Maybe you're checking these daily or, or, or something like that, but you really don't need to go through everything to see if things are all right. Uh, this is a nice way to kind of pick out those important measures that you care about, represent them on your landing page. That way you know if you need to go back uh, into the report and dive a little bit deeper into what's causing an issue. I also have um, some buttons here to go to the data source and maybe run um, a big self-service environment for your users. Uh, perhaps <clears throat> you have some approved published data sources that you can use. Having a button like this allows the user to go right to the data source and start uh, web editing and, and building out their own uh, analytics if they need. Um, so how to build a landing page. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. I'm actually not sure how much time I have left, but. Uh, I'll go relatively quickly. Um, so Tableau Desktop for sure, that's where I use a lot of floating containers and text objects, uh, but keeping in mind that certain things are compatible on Windows and Macs. 
Uh, I use PowerPoint to create some buttons and shapes and, and use custom fonts and things like that within Tableau. Uh, and a newer trend that I've been seeing a lot of people use, which I've, I've played around with a little bit, is Figma. Uh, it's an online interface design application. It is free. Uh, you know, say if you don't have Illustrator or, or something like that, uh, you could use Figma, um, you know, to add different, you know, shadows and paddings and colors. It's a really nice um, tool, and, and I've used it in a lot of my dashboards uh, more recently. And then, again, Pinterest for inspiration. So um, just a kind of a little quick demo here, but how I create, created my buttons, really simple, um, just using some shapes in PowerPoint. So I have my container here with my COPD report. I have my icons coming from flat icon and I've put them into um, my, my little circle here. And then all you have to do is highlight it, right click and save as a picture. Um, and so that's what I've done. Uh, and then I brought that into Tableau as a, as a button image. Um, that way I can assign it to navigate to a dashboard. Again, here we have our buttons from the social media one. So these ones are pretty simple. It was just a, a big rectangle within a smaller rectangle or a smaller rectangle within a larger rectangle that has a thick white border. I have my icons from flat icon and a text object. And again, I just highlight uh, the object, right click and save as a picture. Um, and then again, I brought that in using the button object and changed it to uh, an image within Tableau. Going back to Tableau, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of the stuff, like I said, I've just done, um, you know, floating things within Tableau. So here we can see that I have a, a square here, a floating container here to kind of create that white space. So there's nothing too tricky. Um, it's just kind of coming up with those different modern UI uh, things that we can do to, to make our dashboards look like that. So uh, nothing entirely tricky, but just a lot of little little floating things to, to kind of make it, um, you know, have that modern UI design to it. And the final um, example that I have of a landing page is one that I created um, actually over the weekend. Um, and this one, I was looking, playing with some sports data. And this one uh, is a lot different than what we looked at. This one is more for fun, right? Um, but this one just has our intuitive navigation buttons on it. Uh, so here we have our, our main title, some descriptions over here, some supporting images and some information about me. Uh, and then if I go um, into presentation mode, I forget what the keyboard shortcut is to, to click, uh, I can click on these buttons that will take me to the dashboard. And then I also have some other intuitive navigation buttons uh, here so I could go back to home or I could hit the next arrow to go to our next one. So if you can picture this without the sports data, uh, this might you know be a good use uh, for some of your, your dashboards at work. Um, but yeah, this was just a, a fun one that I did with all the, the different buttons. All right, um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk uh, about today. Uh, so again, <clears throat> my definition of a landing page, uh, it's always gonna be the first dashboard within a workbook that a user will see uh, that captures their attention and provides some context on the data that they're about to consume. So we want our users to feel comfortable with our dashboards. We don't wanna scare them away with tons of filters, tons of lines and bars and charts and all this extra stuff. Uh, so maybe give them that landing page so they, they know what they're about to get into. They know the data that they're going to see, some important definitions and things like that. Uh, we want to use them when we have a, a group of related dashboards. If not, we can use that show hide container for maybe those CEO uh, summary dashboards. Uh, and then always, again, you know, I, I mentioned this, try to brand your dashboards, make them yours, use your approved company colors and logos uh, to really give them um, that that UI feel that is specific to your company or your clients. Um, so thank you again uh, to the Atlanta and North Texas Tableau user groups for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, feel free to reach out to me on, on Twitter um, or on, on LinkedIn. I'd love to answer any other questions that you might have outside of here. Uh, or if you just want to connect and talk about Tableau, uh, please reach out. But uh, thank you again, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this discussion on landing pages. Let me give it one minute just to see if there's any questions. That was awesome, Eric. I think my favorite thing that you were showing was um, everything kind of grayed out in the background and those like the info button with the, um, you know, like little text that kind of guides you through. I've never seen that. And that was amazing. Oh, thank you. All right.
right, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, I will keep monitoring them. And Eric, if you want to just kind of keep checking the Q&A, um, just to keep us on track and with time, um, we can hand it on over to uh, Tim and Joey. All right, hey guys, uh, I'm Joey Ramos. I'm part of the uh, leadership team for the North Texas Tableau User Group. And I have uh, Tim Katie with me. Yeah, uh, so, so we have the other ahead. half of the, uh, the leadership team, as Joey mentioned, uh, for this uh, North Texas group. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things we do in North Texas um, is we focus a lot on real world examples. Uh, because of that, we came up with a sort of bit that we do every month uh, that we call Tableau in the real world, um, where we take uh, specific Tableau functions, uh, actions, and dates, as you can see for this uh, specific, uh, specific demo, and show how you might apply them in a real business setting. So that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so this catchy title uh, comes from Tim. Uh, it's uh, get your dashboard more action with these dates. And uh, just like Eric just mentioned, we use a lot of navigation buttons. So up here, we'll just use that to uh, proceed to our next, uh, our next dashboard. All right, so like Tim mentioned, uh, we started a segment uh, probably last year, this time last year called Pablo in the Real World. Um, basically, as it says here, we just want to sort of demonstrate how to apply Tableau functionality to real world scenarios, right? We all have day jobs and, and we have managers and executives come to us and say, hey, I want a dashboard with X, Y, and Z functionality. And then what we do is we turn around and come and say, okay, I want to ask you this, you know, if your, your client needs this, this is how, you know, you could go about, uh, you know, uh, answering those questions or providing that functionality. And uh, during these, these uh, short demos, we're not going to focus too much on design or layout or how the visual looks. We're really trying to emphasize the actual functionality of the tool. Um, so forgive us <laughs> if these visuals look a little rough. But uh, you want to go ahead and, yeah. So the scenario we're going to go through today, um, our boss has asked us to create a year over year, period over period analysis for him or her. Uh, so what they're going to want uh, for that analysis is they want to be able to pick their date range. They don't want anything anchored or fixed. Uh, they're going to have a dynamic axis. Um, of course, that means being able to switch between day, month, quarter, and year. Um, this is something I'm sure you all have issues with is it needs to be interactive, but people always want to print for some reason or export to um, PDFs. Uh, we're going to do a couple of comparisons, one being discrete, one being continuous. Um, and there's a few things we're going to need to create all this, right? We're going to need that dynamic two date calculation. We're going to need a couple parameters to establish our date ranges. We're going to need parameter actions. And uh, we're going to leverage, uh, I believe we're going to leverage a Tableau date update or extension. We're going to show that off a little bit. All right. All right, demo time. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to a fresh workbook. And uh, please note we are using uh, Superstore. And we're using uh, version 2020.1. All right, Tim, you want to take it? Yeah, so I'll walk you through kind of the steps of, of what I want to do here on this first one. Uh, so the first thing, let's go ahead and throw, um, you have average sales there. Let's go ahead and throw that on uh, columns. And on rows, let's do a discrete month of, uh, of our order date. Go ahead and make that a bar chart if you would. All right, so right now this is just showing average sales by month. Um, what we're gonna do is actually leverage a set action to compare year over year. So what we need to do is first create a calculated field that breaks our order date out by year. To do that, we are just going to uh, go ahead and type a uh, year. Ah, yep. Year of order date, perfect. Okay. 
and we are going to, uh, yep, made that a dimension. So we're going to actually create a set based off of that new dimension we have now. And for now, we can go ahead and include all. Uh, later on, when we apply the set action, that's when we'll be changing the year. And uh, just to prepare us for later, let's go ahead and put that, uh, that set on size and color. Those are the two things we want to leverage here as our set changes. All right. And uh, one last thing that we need to do before we leave this page, um, when we apply the set action as is, it's going to try to stack the in and out um, on top of each other. So we're going to take stack marks off in our analysis uh, menu. Perfect. So um, at this point, we have nothing to, to generate that action off of. So we're going to create a second sheet, uh, if you would, Joey. Just a second sheet with uh, maybe a year of order date on text. Uh, year. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah <laughs> year of order date. That's what drives the set. And uh, now we're going to have to go ahead and put both of these in a dashboard together. That's a bad title, sorry. <laughs> no, that's OK. <laughs> So I'm going to float this on here. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. So as is, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do something like that just for the demo. Yeah. So as is interacting with those dates, clicking on 2020 or 2019 at this point does nothing. Uh, what we want to do is actually uh, create the set action by going to dashboard dashboard actions and add a change set value action right there at the bottom. Uh, we want this action to impact both sheets. It's coming from our target set of the orders sample superstorm and we only have one set in there so we're going to go ahead and use set year. Yep, go ahead and hit OK. So now once Joey interacts with 2020 or 2019, uh, it's going to show what's in and out of that set. So in essence, what we're comparing are the averages of 2019 for any particular month to the uh, averages of the other three remaining years. So um, this helps us in our full-time jobs, uh, helps us establish some seasonality with um, uh, traffic, uh, in particular flight traffic. So this is something we would use uh, in our kind of day-to-day -day lives. Uh, one thing that is missing here, though, uh, is our year-to-date filter. Right now, it's showing all of 2020 because we've faked some dates here. So what we're going to actually do is go, go ahead and put in a year-to-date field. Yeah, let's go ahead and create another calculated field. And this uh, calculation is going to be a date part where we're going to be taking the day of year. Uh, what this is going to do is count how many days into the year um, each, each month is, or each day rather. And we only want to keep values that are less than the count that is today. So for example, if we're 160 days into the year, we only want to keep values that are less or equal to that. Perfect. So if we go ahead and hit, and put that in filters and hit true, That's now showing us through April of 2020. Go ahead and go back to our dashboard there and interact with that filter one more time. So it's showing us uh, 2018, right, is the blue value that's in the set. The remaining three years are out of the set and it's only showing data through, uh, what are we, April 16th? So only showing data through April 16th. Uh, so that's a real quick way to leverage set actions um, when doing a year-over-year -year analysis. A real quick visual uh, you can put together for that. Um, we have a, yeah, we have sort of a finished version here of what we, something we might create for uh, using Superstore, rather. 
Uh, Joey will walk you through some of those actions and how they're how they're changing the other visuals. Yeah, so uh, we have a set action up here, just like uh, Tim did, just demonstrated, uh, that allows the individual to compare whatever year they select to the average sales of all other years, uh, year to date through April 16th for each year. Down here right now, our access is looking at um, by day. So you can do the running sum by day. You can see 2019. Uh, I don't have my access showing here, but at some point took over the average for the other years, uh, but then later lagged off towards uh, the end of March and April. You can then also, by using a uh, parameter action, date part parameter action, you can also change a, an axis down here to make it more dynamic. So when the user hovers over it, they're looking by week or by day or by month. Absolutely. So that was the other action we wanted to focus on. Um, do you want to hop over to that uh, walkthrough? Yeah, absolutely. I know we're uh, pretty short on time. So real quick, you know, another thing we get uh, a lot from executives is, hey, I want my, or, you know, analysts is, hey, I want my uh, access to be dynamic. Uh, so in order to do that, what we have to use is date part parameter actions. And if we go ahead and jump over to a dashboard that I had started. Uh, I have a trend here, let's do this tiled. Uh, I have a very simple trend chart with a from date and a to date parameter. Uh, I, what I did was I created a date part sheet. So the way you do that is I brought in uh, a parameter action file, really simple to create this. If you just jump over to Excel, I created one column date part, so this is what's going to feed the date trunk calculation that we're going to create. And this is how it's going to be displayed to the user. So very simply, I can just control this, control C this, go back to my demo and just control V it. It'll bring in that file. As a clipboard, all I did was rename it parameter action file. And here you can see the data that it brought in. Go ahead and just close this. I already have it. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to drag this, we're just float it up here. All right, and then for the sake of time, let's real quick create a parameter based off that date part. We're going to populate it from that uh, data source, parameter action, date part. Go ahead and click OK. Now what I want to do is in order to make this access dynamic, I have to create a, a calculation that I'm going to call order date access. And basically it's just going to be a date trunk utilizing this parameter and an order date. I'm gonna make this a continuous exact date. And so if I uh, go ahead and show this up here, you can see now we've all probably used this before, right? This is nothing new. I can have a dynamic access based off a parameter and based off that calculation I just created. All right now we're looking at it by quarter. Go in here in my title, just so that the user knows the level of granularity. All right, right now it's by quarter, by day. But what we want to do is we want to add a little bit of flair to our dashboard, right? So, and of course we want to make it as interactive as possible. Let me go ahead and show that parameter. So you can see here, what we want to do is by creating this date part sheet, when we click day or hover over day, week, month, we want to pass this date part to this parameter in order to then um, uh, change the level of granularity of this access. So real quick, go to dashboard actions, change that. So when I click on or hover over my date part sheet, 
I want to target my date part parameter with my date part uh, column from my parameter action file. And then watch what happens to this parameter and then watch what happens to the access. Now when the user hovers over this, they can change the level of granularity of that access. And if you can real quick, take a look at, uh, here's a finished product. Uh, a lot of what Eric says about, you know, adding flare and adding buttons, uh, it really helps the um, customer experience. So we've got, of course, some buttons up here, navigate. We have, uh, so here's the old, we don't need this anymore, right? Because now we're passing, changing that uh, parameter based off the parameter action. So let's get rid of that. Uh, also, we have over here to the left, it tells you which period you're viewing. And uh, also one thing I did want to say that we do um, also have in here a button. So we were talking earlier, Eric was talking earlier about the collapsible containers. This is a collapsible container that actually has a GIF that shows the user how to use the dashboard. And it's just on a repeat loop. So sorry, a little crunch for time. Does anyone have any questions? Also, real quick, uh, we want to give credit where credit is due. Tim, working with Tim's been great because he brings a lot of new ideas to me. Uh, and then Tim wanted to make sure that uh, we gave uh, credit for our inspiration to uh, Kevin Fleurlange's blog. Yeah, so this uh, this date part parameter idea, I had uh, I had seen it on one of uh, Kevin's visits and I thought it'd be great for what we do kind of in our, our full-time gigs. So it's something we started leveraging quite a bit. So That's a great job. Well, no. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. There was one question, uh, Joey, uh, about yeah. the grayscale on the bar chart. So if you could hop back over to. I'm sorry. The, I'm, a, I'm sorry. On what scale? The uh, grayscale on the bar chart. So oh, it's okay. the, gotcha. the values. Uh, so the gray part that you see there. Uh, is everything that's outside of the set. So it's uh, 2017, 18, and 2020. So basically everything that's not selected currently. And that's uh, average sales, in this case, for those months, uh, for those specific years. All right, any more questions? I think that was the only one. All right, I will hand it back over to Nelson because I think Nelson has the uh, the deck. Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you. Sweet. Before we get to the deck, I was going to do one thing. Uh, let's just share my screen. Uh, and it looks like we've got a winner. So data-driven as we are. Um, so for those of you who are interested in doing the Lit Leaders with us, um, Again, uh, May 14th, our book is going to be Make Your Bed by Admiral William McRaven. Uh, phenomenal uh, YouTube video of, uh, of this as well. So uh, definitely feel free to, to check that out. So uh, with that, you know, y'all, this has been a real pleasure uh, to, to do this together. Uh, you know, we definitely would love your feedback. Uh, the North Texas guys have got the, the, the Twitter piece there. Uh, I know we've got uh, ATL Tug as our Twitter here in Atlanta. We've also got our Slack channel. Um, and uh, to stay up to date on all things A Tug, uh, Karen's got her awesome and amazing um, Tableau Public. Let's see if I can click that and good things happen. Oh man, look at that. It's like technology winning the day, baby. Um, and so uh, kind of on behalf of definitely the, the Atlanta side, uh, thanks everyone so much for attending. Um, kick it over to you guys. Y'all did a great job um, talking us through. I love the title of, of y'all's talk. Uh, a little bit more action on your dates. That's that's well done. Um, but turn to you guys to to close us out. Yeah. Again, just a big thank you uh, to the leadership team of the Atlanta Tug for you guys being willing to collaborate with us. You know, that's what this community is all about. It's better than any tool out there, just for the fact that this community is so willing to share ideas. And so willing to work together. So, so big thanks for you guys' um, willingness 
to, to do a joint tug with us. And just everybody that joined today, um, big thanks from us. Tim? Oh, can one, real quick, let me point out in the chat, we've had someone mention um, Tableau has their e learning free for 90 days. If anyone's interested or could benefit from that, just the link is in the chat. Just click there and you'll get some more information, but that could be really beneficial for some folks. And I think we've, we've shared so many great resources today. One thing we might do is just to follow up email with everybody, um, get you know some of the stuff from Katie and from Eric, and I'll throw out some of the stuff that we put together and have you guys share your dashboards and whatever. I think that would be super helpful. I know that there are a ton of people who were trying to grab different links and whatnot, but um, there's so much great content that we had today. So make sure that that happens. Uh, don't, don't want to spam everybody, but I think uh, there's some good stuff for sure. So before we go, I do want to mention one more thing. In addition to the 90 day e-learning, for those of you that are interested, uh, the Tableau Fringe Festival is holding uh, their third data fan community jam event tonight. Um, so they have multiple uh, Zen speakers, um, including Anya Hearn and uh, Jeff Schaefer. Um, so it's, I believe it's six Eastern, don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, we'll post that link in the, uh, in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. All right, guys, big thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks we will everyone. See you in what? Uh, a few weeks. Stay tuned yeah, for Stay safe. Uh, yeah, exactly. Everybody stay safe. Thanks really for having us, y'all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care.